Hello, welcome to the Aberystwyth Business School A-Level Business Lecture Series. I'm Dr Julie Abbott and I'm going to talk to you this morning about marketing and strategic planning. <clears throat> so the learning outcomes for this is to understand the terms and approaches around strategic planning in marketing, so the overarching frameworks that we use, and then understand some of the frameworks that we use at every stage of the process. So the overarching planning frameworks, there are a number of these, but the two that are used uh, most usually for this are Paul Smith's SOSTAC, which goes through a situation analysis, objectives, strategic options, tactics, actions and controls. And we're going to look at this in more detail as we go through this morning. And then there is uh, the Wilson and Gilligan framework, which is where are we now? Where do we want to be? How do we get there? Which way is best? And how do we know we've arrived? And they link uh, to the SOSTAC framework uh, as well, and we'll have a look at that on the slides to see how they, they match together. So the situation analysis, which is where are we now on, on Wilson and Gilligan, and that analyzes current environments. So what do we mean by the environments? <clears throat> well, first of all, there's the internal environment within the business, which is the organisation itself. And it's understanding how it works, um, the, the culture of the organisation, and so on and so forth. Then we have the micro external, and that's often called the MISO or performance environment. And that's the immediate uh, external environment. And that's the one that the organisation works within, but it has the power to change. So it's like the competitive environment. And which one, the one where we look at the customers, um, the publics, all the stakeholders really that the uh, organisation has to work with. <clears throat> and then finally we have the macro environment. And this is the overarching external environment. And, and this is one that the organisation cannot change unless of course it's a very large organisation uh, and has the ability to lobby governments but otherwise it has to work within the bounds of this external environment. So these are the models that we use for these environments. And we often start off with the macro external, which we use a, a framework or model called PESTEL. And that's an acronym that stands for political, environmental, social, technological, economic and legal. And so we look at all of these different areas to understand what's going on uh, within the uh, area that the, government, that the organization's working at. And that can be national, local, international. And to understand what areas have an effect on the company or the organization. So for example, if there are big issues within the economy, that might have an effect. There might be social issues, there might be technology changes, and that's not just uh, IT or high tech that we tend to think about, but could be the type of production technology that is used. And all of these might have an effect upon this, this organisation that we're looking at. Once we've done that, we would look at the micro external environment and would use um, frameworks such as Portify Forces. This is being looked at uh, separately within this uh, lecture series, so I'm not going to go into too much detail about that, apart from to say this looks at the competitive environment within the industry. Then we have a SWOT and a TOES, and again I'll talk about that in a moment. STP looks at segmentation, targeting and positioning of the company uh, for the markets and the customer set. And again, this has been looked at separately uh, in another uh, lecture. And then we have a Mendelow stakeholder analysis, which helps you to look at all the stakeholders uh, that the company has. So those can be external and internal. <clears throat> and by stakeholders, it can be anybody that the company touches. So it can be the general public, customers, employees, uh, competitors, and so on and so forth. And there are many others as well. And it depends on what level uh, um, that we're looking at this planning for. It can be for a specific theme, 
we might be planning for improving customer relationships, for example, in which case you might use a series of frameworks that are relevant just to customer relationships. So once we've looked at the external environments, we then look at the internal environments. And to really understand the organisation, we could use a framework such as McKinsey 7S, when we look at the company and some hard aspects of the custom company, such as its uh, systems that it has and its strategies. And then we have some softer aspects, such as skills, staff, and so on and so forth, and the shared values around the whole company. There is a matrix that looks at the uh, company's portfolios, be they um, products or services, and this is the BCG matrix or the Boston Consulting Group matrix. And this tries to understand where um, your products and services sit within the marketplace that they're, they're in. The seven Ps we have looked at in uh, different uh, lectures within this series. And those are, are understand the marketing mix. So product, price, promotion, place, process, physical evidence, and people, of course. And again, we can look at Mendelo for the internal stakeholders. And again, there are more. So the SWOT and the TOES can be external and internal. And we tend to use that at the end to pull everything together to understand where we are, and also what we need to do in order to improve and to meet objectives that will be set. So that's a situation analysis. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of frameworks and models that we would use to do this. And as far as planning time is concerned, I always expect to have 60 to 70% of the planning time looking at the situation analysis. So we really understand where we are today. Then we have our objectives, which is where do we want to be? And these are often given to us, particularly when we are looking at marketing planning rather than overall business planning. So they will be handed down to us to understand what, what we have to do. And these can usually are a subset of the longer term goals for the business. <clears throat> and the longer term goals are also a subset of the overall vision of the company. So that everything we do goes to meet that vision and to achieve the overall vision that the company wants to achieve. And that's very long term, can be between 15 and 25 years, dependent on how forward thinking the company is. But the objectives that we look at in this planning tend to uh, live the life of the plan and we always think that these strategic plans last about three years as marketing plans. So objectives we would set as we'd have a three-year objective, a two-year objective and a one-year objective usually or a number of, of, of objectives across the three years. And they have to be in smart format. So they have to be specific, measurable, achievable, relevant and time-bound. Because if they're not, we can't measure them, we can't know whether we're achieving these objectives and this is something we really have to do. And there are lots of uh, types of objectives that we will have. There will be financial objectives, uh, marketplace objectives. So we could have an objective that is to <clears throat> achieve a growth of say 10% year on year for the next three years uh, for a particular product or service. After we've understood the objectives and we understand um, where we are now, we have, have uh, our situation analysis, we put the two together to understand how to go forward. And this is the strategic options. And that links into Wilson and Gilligan's how do we get there and the which way is best type because we, we, we look at lots of different options and then choose a number of them. So this is sort of the big picture of how we're going to move forward in the organisation over a number of years. So it achieves the objectives and also sets the company up or the organisation up towards working and, and achieving the longer term goals and ultimately the vision. 
So we determine these options in terms of products and markets usually for, particularly for the, the, the strategic marketing plan. And we'd use a number of models and some of those that, that we use most of all would be uh, Porter's generic strategies when we look at whether we're a mass player or uh, uh, whether we're looking at uh, cost control or whether we're looking at differentiation or whether we're looking at focus areas. So the, there are a number of ways that we can, we can play uh, within the markets. Um, STP again is here, segmentation, targeting, positioning, because we need to know what markets we're going for and how we're positioning ourselves within those markets. And also we have the ANSOF matrix, which we use uh, quite a lot. And I'm going to look at that now. But before I do that, this is content that we test in our entrance exams. So um, if you wanted to come to study with us and you want to get an unconditional or reduced offer in the business school, you can successfully complete uh, an entrance exam. And there are more details on here for you to, uh, to have a look at that in, 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 at your leisure. <clears throat> so the ANSOF matrix here, a lot, uh, the product development, new product development is going to be looked at um, at a separate lecture and then the rest of the ANSOF matrix we're going to go into more detail on, on at another lecture as well. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an overview here as how we would use that. <clears throat> so we ultimately, when we have products, we might, and we have products, we have markets that we work in, if we have um, existing products going into existing markets, we call that market penetration and we have particular marketing campaigns that will help us to do that. If we have a new product going into an existing market, that's new product development. And again, we would look at how we would uh, develop those products and have campaigns around it. If we have a new market and existing products, <clears throat> that's a market development. So we're taking what we already know into new marketplaces. And again, there will be a lot of work around how that would happen. And finally, new markets and new products is called diversification. <clears throat> and we often hear about that with farmers when they're moving from the old fashioned traditional farming into opening their farms up as leisure areas, for example. <clears throat> so it's doing something completely different uh, for a new market. And there are risks associated with doing this. So for uh, market penetration, that has a risk factor of one. And we can see that new product development has a risk factor of two, market development a risk factor of four, and diversification is a risk factor of 16. And the reason for this is that if we're bringing new products into an existing market, we know the market, the market knows us, they'll have tried our existing products, and therefore they'll trust us. So bringing a new product into that market isn't overly risky, although it, it, it's still a risk for the company. If we're taking a product that we already know into a new market, that has a risk factor of four because the market doesn't know us. They don't understand what, what we do and we don't know that market. We don't know how they're going to use the product. It might be different from how our existing markets do it. So that's why that has a risk factor of four. And then finally, diversification, where we're taking something new and untested that we're not, we don't know about into a whole new marketplace that we don't know how they're going to react to that, market, to that product and how they're going to use it. So that is very, very high risk for a company. And often they will do that only if they have to. So after we've looked at our strategies and the bigger picture, we have our tactics. And this is where we look at shorter time frames. In, in the marketing terms, we usually look at it as a campaign cycle or, or one year. And this is where we operationalize our strategies. So we're going from strategic marketing now into marketing management. So we develop marketing campaigns usually as part of the tactics. And this is when we start using our marketing mix to do that. This is the seven P's that we use primarily. We might also use some other tools under the promotional aspect of the seven P's here. So the AIDA model or the DRIP model we might use. 
to um, to help us really understand the promotion. So uh, AIDA is when we want to create a awareness or gain attention, interest, desire and action, for example. The tactics then are broken down into a set of activities or actions and these are controlled through project management techniques. So we have to measure <clears throat> every activity to make sure that it's, it's successful and <clears throat> if we're having problems we can we can get to it quickly and fix those problems <clears throat> so we often use things called gantt charts or timelines <clears throat> in order to control these activities uh, and then therefore we're controlling those tactics as well such as the marketing campaign so we break it all down to ensure that we can really look after each piece part so that the whole becomes successful. And what we're trying to do here, as you can see, <clears throat> is, is um, from this simple Gantt chart, is look at the different tasks within the project, um, who's involved in it, the start and end of each activity, <clears throat> how long it's taken and, and, and whether it's done and when it's happening. We might also put things in like the cost for each activity and um, any prerequisites that are in there as well. So any tasks that have to be completed before the new task can be done. And so this starts to give you a picture of what's happening with your, your marketing campaign or, or the project. And finally, we look at controls. <clears throat> and this is where we look at the how, you know, how do we know we've arrived is, is when we look at the Wilson and Gilligan framework. So controls are split into controls and measures. Controls control the project. So if we look back at the Gantt chart, this is part of the control of the project to really uh, make sure that it's working properly and it's going to uh, finish on time and within budget and, and we can we can catch it if, if this is not happening. So we'll put our Gantt chart in place and we'll have things called critical success factors. So what do we have to do at what point? And we'll have project milestones in there as well to really make sure that we're on top of the project and we can deliver. <clears throat> However, we also need to measure the success of the project and that it's achieved its objectives. And these are the measurements. And this is where we have things such as the key performance indicators, uh, looking at the balanced scorecard and the return on investment. So what are we getting back for the money and, and the resource that we're inputting to this project? And on the balanced scorecard, we're looking at the financials, we're looking at people, we're looking at the overall success of that, uh, of our marketing campaign. And so this is, this is where we're getting right down into um, really understanding this this plan that we've put together and we we have to measure because we have to go to our managers and our directors and, and let them know how successful our marketing campaign has been because that's important for the company so we have to keep a really good eye on our plan we don't just write it and then start operationalizing it <clears throat> We keep revisiting it every six months or so we, and we do what we call environmental scanning where we look over again at the situation analysis just to make sure nothing has changed and if it has changed we can go through and update our plan and the campaigns and tactics actions and controls that we're involved in when we write our, our plan and we're looking at controls we don't put them in at the end although it sits down at the end we build them in right from the beginning because that's that's a really important thing to do. Because if we're putting together, say, um, a piece of mail, uh, it could be digital or traditional mail that goes out, we need to know that people are looking at it, that it's being opened. So we have to put in a control and a, and a measure there to make sure that we, we can understand and see when it's been opened. Um, and measure that success of, of, of the open rates, for example, and the, and the fact that people have looked at our websites and, and so on and so forth. So all of these are built in at the time. 
So that's the end of the lecture and I hope it's been informative for you and hopefully you've met the learning outcomes so that we've helped you to understand some more of the terms and approaches around strategic planning and marketing and understand some of the tools that we use at each stage. Thank you very much for your time.